Okay, sorry about that. Um, my computer kind of kicked me off because um, I'm running out of space, so I had to go delete some things, and now we're going to restart my lecture. Or not restart, pick up where I left off. So this was um, another picture of a ghetto, and then this is my final picture of the ghetto. In, um, so you can see this is in a Polish town, and they have sectioned it off, and it's just the Jewish people living there. Um, you also uh, might have heard of the book known as a Di The Diary of Anne Frank. And so um, when the Nazis took over the Netherlands, obviously all Jewish people in the Netherlands as well, too, were threatened um, by the Nazis. And so they were, um, they went and hid in uh, the factory or the, the workplace that her father used to work at. They went and hid in the annex and to hide from the Nazis for as long as they could. And then um, Anne Frank obviously kept that diary the entire time she was living there. Um, I've been there a couple times, and it's very, very, very small um, place where they lived in. Very, very cramped. Like, my brother's, like, 6'2", and, like, walking through those staircases and even, like, standing up within those places, like, he couldn't stand up all the way. And, like, walking through those staircases were very, very narrow. Um, but they were able to hide from the Nazis for two years. Um, and then when they were discovered, um, they were sent to the concentration camps. And unfortunately, um, everyone from the Frank family died beside, besides Anne's father, which was Otto. Anne and her family were sent to Auschwitz, and they all died besides Otto Frank. And if you ever go to the Anne Frank New Museum in Amsterdam, which is in the Netherlands, you can see the excerpts of um, Anne Frank's diary. This is not my picture. They don't allow you to take pictures of it. Um, but this is the actual diary of Anne Frank. And so... Um, yeah, this is Otto Frank when at the museum, um, when it very first opened and he's reflecting. Now, this is another picture of the arrival in the ghetto. As you can see, people like tried to carry as much as they could with them. A lot of people just focused on their valuables like jewels and things like that. Some people you can see they brought furniture pictures, but they tried to bring anything that they could with them. Um, and then they're crammed in these little tiny buildings with, like, many other people. You can see some of the daily life um, living in the ghettos, um, like the brother feeding his sister, the Nazi offer terrorizing the elderly woman with a whip, um, children selling books to earn money. Even though money really wasn't worth anything in the ghetto, everything was by trade. And so um, you bargain and things like that, um, or barter, excuse me. Um, and then there's also Jewish men remove loaves of bread from a wagon at the soup kitchen in the Kalis ghetto. And so um, it had very, very basic food. As you can see, by mid-1941, Jews received a ration card that only provided 184 calories a day. Guys, like, a lot of times you eat a granola bar or anything like that. Like, that's more than 184 calories, and that is what they were limited to per day. Uh, there was no meat. All they had was bread and potatoes, and they would just, like, give these people a potato. Like, it's not like they were cooked. They just gave them a raw potato. Um, a lot of times they would stick them on sticks and, like, try to cook them over the fires um, in the ghetto. And so there's also an example of a ration card um, that would allow them to get food while they were in the ghetto. Now, Hitler, finally, he realizes that this is taking up too many resources and taking up way too much money. Um, and he is essentially, it is known as the liquidation of the ghettos and he will completely get rid of these ghettos and start shipping off all of the people from the ghettos to the concentration camps. And they were crammed on those trains, those cattle car trains, um, as many people as they could fit. People could hardly breathe. Um, and like you were essentially just standing up squished in there like cattle and um, there was almost enough. There wasn't enough oxygen really that was getting in those things, and so some of those people died. And then you also have to think like, you might be in there for a couple of weeks. Um, you might, I mean, bathrooms and things like that as well too. Um, and so they were all sent to this uh, concentration camps. They kind of, in some areas, they tricked them and made them think that they were going to be able to take their possessions. And actually, the Nazis took all their possessions. And so also, like I've seen in a movie and read about it as well too, like their jewels like um, diamonds and things like that, they would put in bread and swallow those to try to make sure that those things would stay with them. Families were often separated. They oftentimes, like, they just said, boys over here, girls over here. The girl cart might be going to Auschwitz while the other one might be going to Dachau or Buchenwald. So um, they were stripped of everything when they got to the concentration camps. Um, essentially, you were stripped completely naked and you went through a medical examination and you were deemed whether you could work 
or whether you would need to be killed. If you were too sickly, they would just kill you um, because the point of the concentration camp is to do labor. And so if you were sickly, you were killed. If you made it past the health exam, uh, then you were sent to go live in the concentration camp. At Auschwitz, in particular, you were given a number that was tattooed on your wrist, on the inside of your um, wrist. And um, that is how they identified you when they did roll call every single morning. They went through extreme hunger, humiliation, and hard work that often resulted in death. Because the purpose of these labor camps were not to just keep people alive. The purpose of these labor camps was to eventually kill these people. The conditions in which they put them in uh, was to purposely kill off these people. Uh, and their sleeping quarters and things like that, they were crammed into these wooden barracks that housed thousands of people. So essentially it was like a piece of wood um, and it's like a bunch of bunk beds and they would pile in like five or six people on each one. Um, everyone, mostly their hair got shaved because they didn't want people getting lice, but obviously people still got lice. They had fleas, they had rats running around. And so like I said, this combination was deliberately designed to kill the Jewish people or anyone they considered enemies of the state. Um, these concentration camps were not meant to keep these people alive. So this is showing you um, the area where the, you have most concentration camps. Um, this thing will show you the little white triangle was a concentration camp and an extermination camp. That's getting into phase three. Just the black triangle is a concentration camp. So you can see um, Buchenwald in Germany, that was just a concentration camp. That's one of the camps the United States will liberate. Dachau was just a concentration camp, which is by Munich, Germany. That's another one that the United States will um, liberate. Um, Sobibor, if you've ever heard of the um, movie Escape from Sobibor, um, you might have saw that in Religions. Uh, that is the red, um, not red, excuse me, black square. And then you also can see Auschwitz. Um, that is a concentration camp and then was turned into an extermination camp. So you can see um, where everything is. This is after the liquidation of the ghettos. You can see everyone's stuff was just left behind. Some people tried to hide out in the ghettos and like wait till the Nazis left and then tried to run away. And they had all sorts of crazy different hiding spots. But the Nazis came back that night and killed as many people as they could find that had stayed behind and tried to hide out from the Nazis. So you can see this is in the Warsaw ghetto. They're being liquidated. They had no time for to answer questions. They shot a lot of people on site as well too if they tried to argue with them. Now they're being herded and um, transported on these cattle cars. You can see this is one that's been preserved. And so like they would fit 50 to um, 75 people in these cattle cars. And you can just see like that tiny little window. Um, and there was just not much oxygen or anything going in there. Sometimes it'd be freezing. Sometimes it'd be super hot. And you have to think like everyone's breathing on you and things like that it was horrible. This is from the outside what one of those cattle cars looked like. And that's how they were transported to the concentration camps. You can see this woman. I said it was on their wrist. It could also be on their forearm. Um, you can see this woman was a um, prisoner at the Auschwitz concentration camp because she has the tattoo. And here are people um, at the concentration camp as well. There's another picture of a concentration camp. Um, we'll get to some more pictures here in a little bit, but you can see they were given very distinct uniforms. They would have to come out every single day and do roll call. Um, and roll call would last anywhere from two to three hours because they had to make sure every single prisoner was accounted for. Um, and if you fell down, fell out of line, that was a sign of weakness and that you were sickly and you would be sent to be killed or shot on spot. Um, if you couldn't even stand through roll call and you can see, um, these are people that are just arriving. And then there's children there by the fence. It reminds me of the um, movie, The Boy in the Striped Pajamas. This is um, the types of barracks um, that people were living in. So you can see it's essentially just wood laid down and people would lay down um, as many as they can on there. Uh, if you guys have read the book Night by Ely Weasel, this guy right here, I think I have a picture of him later. This guy right here is Ely Weasel, the author of Night. So you can see they're essentially dying of starvation as well, too. They're just skin and bones. Another um, picture of the living quarters. 
And on Monday when I get back, I'll show you guys my pictures. I have actually been to Auschwitz um, and Auschwitz-Birkenau, and I've been to Dachau. And so I've seen um, three different concentration camps. And so I have some pictures of what those look like today, and I'll show you um, some of the stuff that's left there. And then you can see um, how famished these people are um, because the Nazis weren't giving them the proper health care or food. Now, he, Hitler is then going to move on to the final solution, which is the third state of the Holocaust, which is going to call for the systematic killing of the entire Jewish people. From the beginning of the Holocaust, the Germans had been mass, um, uh, mass killing the Jews and other civilians. Like They fell out of line. They weren't agreeing with the orders. They, they would just kill them. Um, and following the German invasion of the Soviet Union, Hitler... Um, is going to call for the destruction of all of Europe's Jews. So this is happening in 1941 <clears throat> is when he's going to start building these things called extermination camps. And essentially because he's trying to get rid of a single group of people, this is a genocide, uh, which is the systematic killing of an entire population is when you are purposely killing a specific group of people. Um, that is then known as a genocide. At first, the bloody work of the um, extermination camps was carried out by the Itzagruppen, which is a special unit of the SS. And these people were, um, like these were the, uh, the killing squads. And they would just line these people up and they would just shoot them. And then the Jews were, the people in the concentration camps were responsible for taking the dead Jewish bodies and burying them um, in these massive graves. Well, however, that's taking too long. And something they're going to realize later, it starts to smell and it leaves evidence of what they're doing, and they're going to have to deal with that later on. But because of just like you know, wasting all this ammunition, and it's taking way too long to kill these people, they then are going to Hitler's then going to propose uh, what is known as the final solution, and when they are going to establish six new camps that are known as extermination camps, and these extermination camps will purposely be built with the facilities to systematically kill these people faster and more efficiently. Unlike concentration camps, many of the people were killed upon their arrival. Um, they weren't as particular as who got to stay alive and who got to go work within the camp. They were killing off more people. Um, so essentially when you would get there, um, you were just like you went through the health exam, you were stripped down to your clothing, you were told you were going to go take a shower, and essentially you were not going into a shower. You were going into a gas chamber. And in this gas chamber... Um, what was being released is a poison known as Zyklon B. Um, Zyklon B, and you'll see a can of it here in a minute, about Zyklon B could kill around um, 100 Jews. It would kill around 100 Jews, um, this can of Zyklon B. And so the largest of the six death camps was Auschwitz-Birkenau, and they had a, um, a few gas chambers. There wasn't just one. You know, The smaller camps had just one. Auschwitz-Birkenau was the largest extermination camp, and it had a couple gas chambers that were quite large and underground. And at Auschwitz-Birkenau, uh, they killed around an average of 12,000 people a day. They are going to kill a little over a million people at Auschwitz-Birkenau itself. Uh, out of the 12 million that are going to be killed, one million come from this one place alone, which is the most deadliest concentration camp. So a little bit about Auschwitz since I um, visited there. I feel like I have a good knowledge base about it. There is Auschwitz one and there is Auschwitz two. Auschwitz one, um, it was the very first one built. Honestly, like it was not a, what I expected. Um, there you can see the famous sign that is by Aus or in Aus at the entrance of Auschwitz one, uh, which is work will set you free, our epic mock frey. Uh, which is work will set you free. Um, and so, um, oh shoot, I lost my train of thought. So essentially, um, the, like, this just looked like part of a town. Like it's literally right next to the town and you had just have all these red brick buildings. And I was like, this looks way too nice to, to, um, to be a concentration camp. Um, but no, it was the very first concentration camp and, um, 
and it, I just was not expecting it at all. It was like these, like these red brick buildings and everything was in perfect rows. You know, when I think concentration camp, I think of this, like, like this field and you have these, all these barracks and stuff like that and these gas chambers. Well, the gas chambers weren't actually at Auschwitz one. They ran out of room at Auschwitz one and are then going to have to build this location, which is probably the most famous one, which is Auschwitz Birkenau. Auschwitz Birkenau is about 20 minutes um, away from Auschwitz one. It's a little bit more out in the country. Auschwitz one is right next to people in the city. Like they saw what was going on at these concentration camps. Um, Auschwitz Birkenau was built cause they ran out of room and it is famous for this building here and the railroad tracks that are entering into, um, Birkenau. I've also been to this place as well too. Um, but this is where you have the massive gas chambers. I guess at Auschwitz one, there is one gas chamber, um, in a crematorium and there as well too, but there's multiple gas chambers and crematoriums at Auschwitz Birkenau. That's what this one is, is called Auschwitz two. Um, but I kind of already talked about this. Like they were separated into workers sent being sent to death. Um, I left all their belongings behind. They were sent to a room where they said they were going to be, uh, taking a shower. They were even given soap in some instances, and then they were gassed to death. So from these shower heads, this gas filled up the room and, um, essentially they would then die. And this gas was known as Zyklon B. Um, and then they would take those bodies, um, and dispose of them. And so this is, you can see at Auschwitz, you can, Auschwitz to Birkenau, you can see the building in the background, the train has came in, they've let all these people off, and now they're going to be divvied up to either be sent to death or to go live within the camps. But as I said, they're sending more and more people to their death. When I said they disposed the bodies, I mentioned that they were buried in these massive pits. Well, as I said, it left a horrible stench and it left evidence. And so this is going to lead to the cre uh, creation of the crematoriums, also known as the ovens. And so because they had these massive graves, essentially, they forced the people who worked in these concentration camps to dig up the dead Jewish people and burn those pits of people so that there was no evidence of what they had done there. And then at the places like Auschwitz and Sobibor, um, they then created the ovens as well too. And so once those people were gassed to death, they were then brought above and put in these crematoriums. And you'll see the picture of the, the crematoriums or the ovens here in a minute. And when we, when I get back on Monday, I'll show you the pictures that I have of it. Um, gassing was not the only meth method of death. Gassing was the most effective and killed the most people. They also had mass shootings. They had hangings and they were injected with poison. Um, there were also, you guys might've heard of the medical experience, uh, experiments that happened, um, at, uh, Auschwitz and at other concentration camps as well too. Um, this did happen and most of the time it w happened on twins and um, because like they would do things like try to change their eye color and stick things in their eye and then with twins they would try to cut off limbs and then um, yeah they would try to cut off limbs and then reattach it to um, the sibling and try to see well, can they like trade limbs and still work. Um, but they were essentially trying to like create, um, like the master race, like with the blue, with the blue eye thing, they tried to change their eye color and whatnot. They also tested equipment and stuff like that on them. So like, um, how long can they last in freezing cold water and whatnot? Um, I don't go into a whole lot of detail on it, but it will be an option for your project. The famous, um, doctor that did all this was Joseph Mengele, Mengele. Um, and the, he was very sadistic. Like they saw him as like this nice person and he got along with the children. Then he would do these horrible experiments on them. These are the, um, ovens. And so you can see these runners here, there'd be this device that would be on these runners and essentially they would stack up the bodies and then they would shove the bodies in there and they would turn the ovens on and then they would bring the bodies out and then they would go dip, uh, dump the ashes in these massive graves. You could always tell the crematoriums by the chimneys. Uh, that is how you knew that was a crematorium. Now, a lot of this stuff today is not existent. And I'll talk about that here in a second. Here you can see the um, pit of bodies um, left at Auschwitz. And so they essentially, they brought all these bodies up and they lit all these things on fire to do away with the evidence. Um, as I mentioned, like you can't just like walk into Auschwitz today and see everything because a lot, when the Russians came and when the Americans came, they destroyed a lot of the concentration camps um, and blew up a lot of the areas as well too, because they couldn't believe what they were seeing. So there's not really, um, 
there's no gas chambers completely intact at Auschwitz that are fully intact. Like you can see the remnants of it because it was destroyed. But yeah, that's a side note. The person most directly responsible for the Holocaust besides Adolf Hitler, you know, giving like this is what we're doing, was Heinrich Himmler. Heinrich Himmler was the man responsible uh, with carrying out the orders that Hitler was giving him. And he was in charge of the concentration camps. He oversaw everything, made sure it was working perfectly and the concentration camps. Here you can see he is visiting a concentration camp. That's him right there. There he is once again. And he, you can see he's looking at a model concentration camp and giving his approval and saying, if this is what it's supposed to look like. And there he is touring a concentration camp. So Heinrich Himmler, the man most directly responsible with the Holocaust. And there he is once again. So what was the purpose of the final solution? Um, hopefully you're thinking to yourself, it was to systematically kill off the Jewish people, um, which is committing a genocide. Now, our last little part here, a lot of people are like, why didn't anyone do anything? Why didn't the Americans do anything? Um, the Americans had heard of this they did hear of this, um, but they, a lot of people thought that it was a tactical rumor. There was no proof that this, this was going on, obviously, because it was over in Nazi Germany. And a lot of people thought it was a tactile, tactile rumor, uh, tactical rumor to scare people in America um, and over in the Soviet Union as well, too. And so um, people ask, well, why didn't the United States do anything? Well, this is one part of that. So, in 1944, as the Soviet Union begins to push westward towards Berlin, remember I said they counterattacked and they're going to be pushing towards Berlin? When they start to push towards Berlin, they are the ones that are going to run into these concentration camps first because they're over in Poland, that's closer to the Soviet Union. And they liberate these camps and they cannot believe what they are seeing. In early of 1945, they discovered Auschwitz and they saw that the Nazis had tried to cover up the evidence. However, there were still bodies in like uh, trucks and things like that that they had uh, just left there because they actually sent the people at the, the camps on this death march um, to try to take the prisoners somewhere else, which killed a lot of people as well too. Um, but um, they, so like a lot of the concentration camps, there was few people left and like pe people just in like these dead people just in back of trucks and things like that as well too. The Soviets reported on the conditions and gave the American people proof of Hitler's terrible plan. And then we are soon going to find out for ourselves. And so this is some of the remnants of what they saw at these concentration camps. Here you can see they are liberated at Auschwitz I. I like this picture because this is um, a Holocaust survivor. And now he has the gun pointed at the Nazi. The Americans will run into Buchenwald and Dachau. These are the two camps that we liberate. Um, they are not the large extermination camps like Auschwitz, they are smaller. They are more so just concentration camps. Dachau was actually the very first concentra concentration camp ever created. And what they found there was appalling and they could not believe what they were seeing. They had heard the rumors and now they know the rumors are true. And so this is at Buchenwald. They just have this pile of bodies here and just like laying around everywhere. You have all these dead people um, because they, the Nazis left because in fear of being captured by the Americans. Um, and there's more victims as well, too. And I want to remind you that these people are extremely malnourished and famished. And you can't just give these people a bunch of food and say, here you go, get better. Like that will shock their system and they will die. There is a process people have to go through in order to get better um, when they are that malnourished. And so it's not as easy as here's food and like water, drink it all, like here, go because they're going to eat too much and it will shock their system and they will die. So medical professionals had to come in and help these people. You might be thinking, what happened to the Nazis? Like, did they ever get um, punished for this? Well, what it is known as is the Nuremberg trials and people were tried for crimes against humanity. The Nazis were. It was organized by the Allied powers and there was 22 Nazis that were tried for war crimes against humanity. The only famous Nazi that was actually tried uh, was Hermann Goring. Um, everyone else killed themselves. They did not allow themselves to be captured by the Allied powers. Hermann Goring was the commander of the Luftwaffe, and he was also in Hitler's inner circle, and he will be sentenced um, to death. Twelve were sentenced to death. Um, others had prison time as well, too. There are still some of these trials happening today. Like, you might see every so often in the news how, like, 
there's this very old man that um, he realized he was a Nazi and like he's being put on trial for what he did and things like that as well too. So some statistics about the Holocaust. As I said, it killed an estimated 6 million Jewish people and then around 5 to 6 million of other civilians, which is your Poles, Gypsies, Disabled, um, homosexuals, Jehovah's Witnesses, and so forth. The survivors that lived through that were forever changed. And we have the book, you know, Night from Ely Weasel, and, you know, they want to spread their story. They want to um, tell people that what they had went through. Um, some Obviously, some people don't talk about it, but some people, they want to, you know, let the world, like, this can never happen again. And I think I've told you guys before, but it is against the law in Germany to, de not, to deny that the Holocaust happened. Um, this is a map that shows how many um, Jewish people were killed of the population. You can see in the German Empire, 80 to 90 percent of the Jewish population was killed off. In Poland, it was 90 something um, that had the highest population killed. You can see in the Soviet Union, 60 to 79. Then you start to get a little bit further south. You get over into France. It's a little bit less. Um, so obviously the German Empire and then Poland uh, was where most of the Jewish people were killed. Uh, once again, this is just showing extermination camps, the ghettos, concentration camps. So our most famous area is Krakow, Auschwitz-Birkenau. This was the worst of all the camps um, and so forth. But yeah, this is where I've been. Most of this was in Poland. Remember that. It's not all in Germany. There's very few in Germany. There is some. Most of it is in Poland because that's where most of the Jewish people were. I think these statistics are interesting. Um, you can see this is how many Polish people were Jewish. 3,300,000 and there was 3 million of them killed. 90% of the Polish Jewish population was killed. Um, and then you can look at the other statistics as well too. But Poland lost the most Jewish people. You can see the Netherlands where Anne Frank was from. 75% of the Jewish people were killed. You can also see by year. The height of the Holocaust was in 1942. Remember I had said um, towards the end of 1941 is when he decides to do the final solution. When he attacked Russia, he then decides he's also going to start mass exterminating the Jewish people. And so 1942, there was 2.7 million people killed in the Holocaust. And you can see the um, camps that had the most people killed was Auschwitz-Birkenau. One million people killed at Auschwitz-Birkenau alone. This, um, after all said and done, some of the people that uh, were captured were forced to watch what the Americans and the Russians found at these concentration camps. And you can see how the Nazis are reacting um, to seeing the visuals of these extermination camps and concentration camps. It's pretty sad. And as I said earlier, Easy, Ely Weasel, the author of Night, that is him there. So that's all I have, and we are going to move on with our project on Monday.